But as, as was said, um, the title of my book is, in English is Knocking on Heaven's Door. I'm in, in, in America, by the way. The people here are great. <laughs> um, knocking on Heaven's Door. And the subtitle was How Physics and Scientific Thinking Illuminate the Universe in the Modern World. Can everyone hear me, by the way? Are these mics in the right place? Okay, good. And so uh, I'm often asked why, why I call, why I use this, this name for the book. Thank you very much. And because, and what we'll see today is part of what I'm trying to get across is sort of how science really advances, how we sort of have this base core of knowledge and how we build on that. It doesn't mean that what came before is wrong, but it, we do find out that what came before can be an approximation to the truth. And so how, with, as technology advances, as theoretical tools advance, how we go beyond that. So as was nicely said, the book is covering two things, really. It's, um, how, it's really how physics today is illuminating the universe in the sense of what we'll be learning from experiments happening right now and also from theori theoretical work such as what I do. But also how scientific thinking is important and I think that, that was especially an important point in America where I think scientific thinking is sort of undervalued and often misrepresented. So as was said, I mean, this is the, the, the title in German is a little bit different. It's uh, referring more to the scale theme that we'll hear more about, the measurement of the universes. But I, I didn't realize the subtitle was a little bit wrong because it says the last thing where it should be sort of the next thing. <laughs> so I, d I didn't look carefully at that, I should have. Okay. So I'm just gonna start with the random picture. Um, and I just want you to look a little bit at this picture. Um, you see it's clearly Paris. <laughs> there's the Eiffel Tower in the background. There's a, uh, there's a kiosk with an affiche, a poster on it. Um, and you, you just see what it is. But what I want you to think about when you look at this picture is that your, your resolution matters. The scale with which you view something matters. How you look at it is important. Um, if you, did you mind moving the background? Okay. Um, how, how you look at this matters. Um, in the sense that if you were to look if you didn't have fine enough resolution, if you were looking from far away or with very bad resolution, you wouldn't even know the Eiffel Tower is there. On the other hand, if you were able to look up close or with finer resolution, you would see the beautiful iron grid work. And of course, if you could get even closer, you would see the underlying molecular structure or, or atomic structure of the iron that it's made of. So when you look at things, it's, we sort of take it for granted but the way, how we view it matters in terms of what we see, in terms of what we would interpret, in terms of what is there. Of course, uh, this is a joke, but the reason I really wanted you to think about scale is because if you blow up the affiche that's there, you'd see my name on it. <laughs> um, that was the advertisement for the opera that we did that premiered in the Pompidou Center. So, hyper music for love. Um, but back to what I was saying, I think it's important to, to recognize that when we, our intuition is very much guided by human scale. How we see things really depends on, on the fact that we see with our eyes. And, and so we're limited to the visible light spectrum. And we're mostly familiar with scales that range from about a millimeter to a kilometer. So beyond that, in either direction, we don't necessarily have so much intuition for what's there. It doesn't make it any less real. It just means that we're not as used to it. And that's important because the physical universe, of course, involves a much greater range of scales. And you know, it was interesting for me after writing my first book, even for people who were very interested in, in what we did, I think just how it all fits together is not as obvious. And so it's important to recognize how important it, this scale with which you view things will be when we interpret what's going on. So just to start off, let's take a very brief tour of, of scales in the universe. Um, so we're going to start with sort of the larger scales. So I'm going to start with the known universe, which is 10 to the 27th meters. That's enormous. That's one followed by 27 zeros. It's, it's a very big number. Now, why is it finite? Why is it a number as opposed to just saying it's infinite? Well, I'm talking about the known universe. That is to say the universe we can hope to observe. Now, the, the lifetime of the universe is finite. It's lasted 13.7 billion years. And the speed of light is finite, which means that if we want to look out, we can only see up to a finite distance. It doesn't mean that nothing exists beyond that, but it means that it's not something that we can hope to observe. 
Now, of course, within the universe, there's a broad range of scales. That's the biggest of the visible scales. But there's a broad range of scales within it. We see galaxies at 10 to the 20th meters. We see an Earth orbit at 10 to the 7th meters. So we see different scales. But, and then, of course, we have a human scale. Which, and, and I just want you to recognize that it's not really a coincidence that a human is about a meter, right? It's about two meters. Most of us are about two meters tall. Because it would be very odd to use a different unit. I mean, this is just a very comfortable, familiar unit. It's something we encounter every day. And we measure everything sort of in terms of our own, our own scale. And so we can have much bigger scales, as we're seeing here. But one thing to keep in mind is that even though this is an enormous range of scales, we have the same laws of physics applying over this enormous range. We have electromagnetism. We have gravity. We have similar laws of physics over this big range. Now, I say this to contrast it to smaller scales. Um, in terms of smaller scales, we actually see new laws of physics that emerge when we can study with sufficient precision, with sufficient resolution, that we can investigate smaller scales. So I start off actually with the human being at the top here. So the human being is the biggest of the scales, about two meters. And now we're going to look inside. And I start off actually with a few biological things to remind you that even in terms of our, our own bodies, the working of our own bodies, until people were sliced open, until you could actually look inside, people didn't know what was there. So the circulatory system, no one knew about it until they actually discovered arteries and veins and tried to put it all together. And red blood cells we saw when we could had the tool to look under a microscope. DNA was discovered by X-ray diffraction. So there's an interesting thing where you know, you can theorize about what's at smaller scales, but until you actually look, it often turns out to be very different from what anyone imagined. And that's one of the reasons we need experiments to probe to smaller and smaller scales. We can guess what's there, but we're very unlikely to get it right until we actually have the actual experimental data to tell us what's going on. And of course, that's what happened. Then we got down to smaller scales, so we get down to, I mean, this is drawn as a, as a discrete border. It's not necessarily quite so discrete. But you get to smaller scales, you get to the scales where quantum mechanics, you get to atomic scales. You're not going to be able to describe an atom without quantum mechanics. And in fact, people tried to describe atoms without quantum mechanics and they failed. That's why they came up, one of the reasons that they came up with quantum mechanics in the first place. Quantum mechanics was designed to resolve some of the mysteries that were posed once an atom was really explored experimentally, once the nucleus was discovered, once the electrons were seen going around it. And there are various scales here having to do with various elements of what's called the standard model of particle physics that tells us about matter's most basic elements in their interactions. That includes objects like an electron. It includes objects like light quarks that are inside protons and neutrons. And it includes heavier objects like the top quark. And each of these is associated with smaller and smaller distant scales. Now, if we keep going, um, we get down to scales that we have not yet explored experimentally. And that's why today's era is particularly exciting. It's the Large Hadron Collider, which I'll tell you more about, is now operating. It's an enormous underground ring, 27 kilometers in circumference. That's supposed to indicate that it's underground, that picture there. And you have protons going around and around, getting accelerated to high energies, the highest energies that have ever been explored before, which is also to say the smallest distances that have ever been explored before. And it's designed to probe scales of about 10 to the minus 19th meters. So extremely small distance scale. It's not the smallest scale you can imagine, but it is the threshold of experiment. It's the smallest scale that we can hope to get with the technology that exists today. And, and in doing so, we're going to answer some very important questions, which I'll also get to. Okay. Now, of course, we can keep going. There are smaller distance scales. But again, those are scales that we're not exploring with experiments. They're scales that we're exploring through theory. And we even think, if for reasons I'll get to later, there might even be a smallest distance scale. And that's why this ends at 10 to the minus 35 meters. And one other thing to take note of, because I think it's important to think about, is that a human being you know, <coughs> is somewhere randomly in the middle on a logarithmic scale between this maximal scale and the smallest scale. It's just some <coughs> random scale in the middle. So what we see is, of course, important, but it certainly doesn't span the breadth of what we can hope to learn once we have the technology to look at bigger and smaller scales. Okay. So what's most striking about this? Well, there's a lot of things that are striking, but one thing is that in some ways it might even seem like too much information to handle. I mean, that was 62 orders of magnitude in scale that we're hoping to describe with the laws of physics. 
And moreover, different physical descriptions seem to enter at different scales. We have quantum mechanics applying on atomic scale. We have classical mechanics applying on larger scales. So in some principle, you'd want to have a theoretical way of organizing all this information. And one of the things I talk about in the book is just how we do this, just what it means, how one theory approximates another. But in summary, we have this idea of what's called an effective theory, that you focus on the scales that are relevant to the problem at hand. In other words, it's like what you do when you use Google Maps. If I'm looking for a particular address in New York, I'm not necessarily going to use a street map right away. I, if I'm coming from Germany, I might want to look at, at a map of the globe first, and then I would want to get to smaller and smaller scales. And in fact, if I try, I mean, the, all the information is there. In principle, I could have it. But if I tried to keep track of all the information at the same time, I would get nowhere. Right? You really, it's just too much information to handle. So you use the theory that's appropriate for the scale that you're looking at. So when we're doing experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, we don't necessarily need to know everything that's <coughs> happening at arbitrarily small distances. We need to know what's happening at that scale of 10 to the minus 19 meters. And eventually, we put it all together to try to have a consistent picture. And one of the reasons I emphasize this is I think a lot of the misunderstandings about science come from not recognizing the separation by scale, by trying to apply the wrong laws at the wrong scales or thinking something's wrong when it's not, when it's merely an approximation. And that's a much longer story. And this is just a very general way of thinking. This is we're at the Einstein Forum. I mean, we have many different types of thinking represented in, in every field. I think there's some an analogy to this way of thinking, to sort of focus either on a big picture or on a small picture. Um, so in general, it's a good way to keep track of things. And in physics, we use this all the time. I mean, one of the most basic examples is if you throw a ball. Even though, I mean, when I was in high school, you know, they said Newton's laws are wrong. We find out that relativity is right or that quantum mechanics is right. But they're actually not wrong. They're an approximation that work as well as they need to. They work certainly as well enough to predict the trajectory of a ball as you throw it. They work well enough to predict, to send a man to the moon. You, know, you don't need to know all these other things that work in different regimes until you have the technology or the precision to probe these more fine details, you, you can do quite well with just using Newton's laws. And that's basically what we're doing now. We have the standard model of particle physics, but we're building on that. And we don't expect the standard model to be wrong, but we do expect it to be large, part of a larger picture where we'll learn deep and fundamental things that underlie its properties. And this is just to set, set the stage. Um, it, we have atomic structure, and at each level, until we were able to get down inside, we didn't see it. But of course, we know that this podium is made up of atoms and molecules. Those are in turn made up of nuclei with electrons going around them. Those nuclei are made up of protons and neutrons, which are in turn made up of quarks. And quarks, as far as we know, are elementary, as are electrons. But we don't actually know they're elementary, and we certainly don't know that all their properties will be described without further underlying structure. And that's what we're setting out with mind today. And I say this in part because when, when I was writing my first book, I realized I hadn't really read a lot of these sort of popular physics books, so I just glanced through a few. And one of the ones I glanced through was One, Two, Three, Infinity by George Gamow, because I was told that was very good. And it was quite a nice book. But, um, but it was very interesting to read a particular quote he had, which I will read to you, which says, instead of a rather large number of indivisible atoms of classical physics, we are left with only three essentially different entities, protons, electrons, and neutrons. So he was living in the era of nuclear physics. They had understood the nucleus, and the nucleus had been understood to be composed of protons and neutrons, <coughs> and of course atoms have electrons in them as well. But then he goes on and he says, thus it seems we have actually hit the bottom in our search for the basic element of which matter is formed. And I say this sort of as a cautionary tale, because it's very easy at any given time to think you have all the answers. <coughs> you've, you've studied it up to a certain point. There's no evidence for structure lying underneath. But of course, not so long later, quarks were discovered, and quarks being part of the protons and neutrons that he thought were indivisible thought were indivisible because he hadn't yet posed the puzzles that quarks were set out to solve, and because they hadn't yet developed the technology to be able to see this inner structure. And so 
I think it's really important to keep this in mind because you know, a lot of people ask, why do you keep looking beyond? You know, what do you th why do you think something is there? But it would be very unlikely that we were at the last time where we're ever going to discover something new. I mean, we always at, we're always probing things at the limit of technology, at the limit of our theories. And it's always going to lead, I mean, and mind you that when they found the atom, they didn't just find the atom, they found quantum mechanics, which is a very deep and fundamental change of the way we view physics that mm -hmm. actually has had enormous consequences just not just for science, but in the world. Um, and the same is true when quarks were discovered. It was not only that were quarks discovered, but the strong nuclear force was discovered, which has very important consequences. So we don't know what's going to be there, but it's not just looking for smaller elements. It's looking for really the nature of forces and the nature of how physics interacts at these smaller distances. So as I said earlier, the frontier <laughs> energy scale today is 10 to the minus 19th meters um, into units of energy. We measure energy in electron volts. So this is a unit that's about 1,000 times the proton mass, if I say pro e equals mc squared. So that's about the energy we're, we're exploring today. The actual, this, the actual energy of the collisions of the machine will eventually be about 14 GeV. But because protons are not elementary, only a fraction of that energy goes into any particular collision. So they'll be probing a few TeV in energy at this collider. And so you see this enormous ring. That ring is actually underground. And what happens is the protons get accelerated. Magnets keep them rotating around in this ring. As they go around, each time they get a little bit of a kick. So it goes around 11,000 times a second. So over the course of 20 minutes, it goes from the injection energy that they come in with to the ultimate energy that you want it to have, the 7 TeV for, each, for the protons in each of the beams. We haven't yet reached that energy. The machine is now running at a little bit more than half energy. But eventually, that's the goal. Um, what you also see listed there are things like ATLAS and uh, CMS. And what these are are experiments. They are experiments where collisions take place. And I'll show you a little bit about them. So the protons are going around. They get accelerated. There are two beams of protons. Then they're diverted. They collide into each other. And when they collide into each other, new forms of matter can emerge. And it's those new forms of matter that we're looking for. A lot of the time, it's just old matter. It's stuff we know is there. But one out of a trillion times, you might be lucky and get something new that can indicate some new underlying structure. So this is a very nice video that somebody on the Atlas experiment made. It shows that it starts off in other smaller rings, and it goes into the main ring, which is this 27-kilometer ring. You can actually walk around this tunnel. There's this beam there. You can walk around. Uh, here, we're following the path of the proton now. And then it, the protons, there's two beams of protons that collide inside an experiment. I mean, obviously, they're going to build an experiment where this collision happens. And then lots of particles come out, and they go through various layers of the detector. I'll tell you just briefly a little bit more about it. I talk a lot more about it in the book, just exactly what they're measuring. But these are designed to measure every property of these particles you can, to try to pin down what it is and what it is not. Is it a standard model particle, or is it something beyond? So the LHC is really impressive. The LHC, I should say, it's the Large Hadron Collider. It's large because it's large. It's 27 kilometers. Hadron is a fancy name that refers to the particles that are protons. So protons are a form of hadron. And it's a collider because, obviously, they collide. And so it's known as the LHC. It's not a very pretty name, but that's its name. Um, the machine has the highest energy. It already has the highest energy. Right now it's running at four times the energy of the previous collider, which was the Tevatron in the United States that just shut down. Yeah, it was on Illinois. Um, and eventually it will have about seven times the energy of that machine. It also has the highest what's called luminosity. Um, again, we're building up to that, but luminosity is essentially a measure of intensity. It's telling you how many collisions happen. If you're looking for rare processes, you want to have as many possibilities of finding something new as you can. So there's two parameters that are really important for these colliders. We hear about energy, but also this parameter called luminosity is very important because it tells you how many collisions you get. And then to get to these things, it involves some pretty fascinating technology. There's, um, it's really amazing to visit. If you have a chance, you should go visit, and especially after this year, it's going to shut down, and you can really walk around. And it's just an inc incredibly impressive machine. It's the coldest extended region, uh, 1.9 degrees above absolute zero, which is colder than outer space. And the reason it's so cold is to have superconducting technology, which is essential to have these giant magnets that keep the protons rotating around in this ring. 
Um, it's the biggest, most effective vacuum, tenth of a trillionth of an atmosphere. And the reason you need that is for two reasons. One is because you want to make sure that you don't get collisions where you're not supposed to have them. You don't want them just colliding with random atoms floating around. But also to maintain the superconducting technology. If, you, if it starts heating up, that would be a problem, and it would so-called quench. It has the strongest magnets in industrial production. That is to say, they're made on this big scale. They have, it's really wonderful to see these 15 meter long magnets that, uh, and there's some fascinating pictures of it going around the streets of, um, in fact, Germany on the way to CERN. It's quite impressive. A lot of them were made here. And um, this huge magnetic field. So it's just, in every way, it's reaching the extreme in order to really maximize all these properties that tell us, so that we can study as much as possible. And as I said, the reasons for these extremes are to collide together these enormously energetic protons. Why do you want energetic protons? Well, E equals mc squared, which tells us that if you have more energy, you can make heavier particles with bigger mass m. So if you want to probe new stuff, you want to have more energy. You want to have as many collisions as possible because you're looking for rare processes. If you buy more lottery tickets, you're more likely to win. And you want to measure the results with efficient and sensitive detectors to figure out whatever it is. And I say this to distinguish the LHC, which is the machine doing the collisions, from the experiments. And the two experiments I primarily focus on in the book are the, what are called the general purpose experiments, ATLAS and CMS, which are designed to measure something new, whatever it is. If it's extra dimension, supersymmetry, a Higgs boson, whatever is new, it's, they're designed to, to find it. Why are we doing this? What are we trying to learn? What is the physics that we're trying to learn today? We want to learn, number one, how elementary particles acquire their masses. It turns out if particles had masses from the get-go, you would make nonsensical predictions. We know that they don't. You would predict things like probabilities of interactions at high energy greater than one. It wouldn't make sense. So there has to be some mechanism in place, and most of you have probably heard of something called the Higgs mechanism which is responsible for particles acquiring their masses. If it is true, there will be experimental evidence. It could be something like the Higgs boson, which is currently being searched for and which we should actually know whether or not exists within this year. We'll, we'll have about four times the amount of data that we do today. We also want to know what explains the weakness of gravity, which is another way of saying that is why particle masses are what they are. Why are they so much lower, it turns out, than what our theory would lead us to predict. Uh, and it's a big problem. It turns out if you include quantum mechanics, it almost looks unstable for particle masses to be as small as they are. And so it really is an indication there's something big and deep that underlies the standard model, which could be possibly features of space and time, which might be probed at the LHC. There could be more symmetry, or as I'll talk about, there could even be an extra dimension of space. And the final thing that we hope to learn about, oh well, it's not the final thing, we hope to learn a lot more, th things we haven't even anticipated, but one target that we have is dark matter, which is really a very different direction. You might say, why are we talking about dark matter? Dark matter is matter that doesn't interact with light, but interacts with gravity. Yet we have a chance of saying something about it at the Large Hadron Collider. And this is actually naively very surprising, but it has to do with the fact that if you had a particle that had the right mass to be produced at the Large Hadron Collider, again, B equals mc squared, and you just traced its cosmological evolution, you would find that the amount of energy stored in that matter today is just about right to agree with what's been measured. It doesn't mean that it necessarily is this particle that has this mass, but it's very suggestive. And so for this reason, people are looking whether there are dark matter candidates that can be produced at the LHC. And just to put it in context, because I think a lot of people get confused about this, what else is beyond? What else could we learn? Well, as I said, when I wrote those original scales, there are many scales we're not studying yet. We're not studying the scales at which string theory would be essential. That is to say, a theory that combines together quantum mechanics and gravity and applies at all scales. At the scale of the Large Hadron Collider, we don't know if it's particle physics that underlies what's going on. We don't know if it's elementary particles or elementary strings. That's because you can only tell the difference if you had 16 times better resolution, which we obviously don't have. And so again, you see this idea of an effective theory in play. It could be string theory underlies what we see. It could be particle physics underlies what we see. 
but we don't yet have the resolution to know the difference. And so you can do theoretical work on either one, but in terms of what we're actually going to understand, the questions we're asking are not whether string theory is right. We're asking questions that I referred to earlier about matches and what sets the scale of matches. And just because it's cool, I'm gonna mention one other thing, which again, is well beyond what we would ever hope to see at the Large Hadron Collider. And this is this idea that there could actually be a shortest distance scale. Um, remember at, at that, when I had those original slides, I sort of stopped it at the scale of 10 to minus 35 meters. And again, this is something that's not essential to understand, to understand the physics of the Large Hadron Collider. But it's a very intriguing possibility that even the notion of space itself, the whole notion of distance, could be an effective theory notion that emerges only at distances greater than 10 to minus 35 meters. Now, why do I say that? Well, there's a couple of arguments, but one of them is, is, is kind of interesting just to understand why I'm saying we're probing short distances at all. So let's just take a step back for one minute just because it's interesting. How do you probe short distances? What do you need to study short distances? Imagine you were sh studying short distances with a wave. You would want to have a very short wavelength. To get a very short wavelength, you need a very high energy, a very high frequency wave. You need high energies and high frequencies to study short distances. And the higher the, your energy, the shorter the distance you can hope to study. That's why when I talk about going to a high energy collider like the LHC, I'm also talking about going to shorter distances. Because in principle, we have shorter wavelengths involved. But what happens when you try to probe the so-called Planck length, which is this distance scale of 10 to minus 35 meters? It turns out you would need so much energy to study this distance that you would actually have so much energy in this short distance you would make a black hole. Now, we don't care about the black hole. What we do care about is the fact that if you added more energy, instead of studying the shorter distance, the black hole would get bigger. Now, why do I say this? This means we don't even know in theory, in principle, how to study shorter distances. So we don't even know what they could mean which be, seems to indicate the possibility that there could actually be a fundamental distance scale, a smallest distance scale we can study. Again, it's not something you have to worry about because effective theories work really well. We don't see the effects of this possible discretization of space-time or these very small distances on the scales we study things, but it's a very interesting possibility that I thought I should include since I was talking about distances and scales. But back to what we're studying today, what we're trying to do is answer those questions that I outlined. We're trying to go beyond well-established theories and find the missing pieces and sort of make discoveries that can't be explained with only the current framework. How do we do that? Well, as theorists, we're trying to use somewhat of economy, some, some notions of aesthetic values to go beyond what we know, but we're also using experiments to choose among possibilities and to provide clues of what they are. And since we're researching new distance and energy frontiers, we have a real chance of answering these questions in the next few years. And this is just the completion of that. We've had that collision, and now you see these particles just go out through the various layers of the detector. And I just show this to indicate how you might find one particular particle. You see what it decays into. You see the track it leaves. You see the path it leaves. You see the charge that it has. And this particular particle is a particle in the standard model called the Z boson. It's like a photon that communicates light or electromagnetism. It communicates a weak nuclear force. And by doing this with every particle that comes out, figuring out what is there from the standard model, you hope to recreate what was there that was beyond the standard model. It could be something that decayed into standard model particles, or it could just be something that has properties not described by the standard model. And that's what's going on today at experiments at the LHC. That's just to say I did this at Okay, so I'm just gonna close, that was, I know that's been a lot of physics for you, but I'm just gonna close with one big idea. Those of you who've read my previous books would know about this already. But one of the things that can be looked for beyond the standard model has to do with the idea of an extra dimensional space. Now that might sound quite remarkable that we can um, say anything about space by looking at these elementary particles. So I just wanna give you a flavor of why that's true. And it has to do with the fact that this theory can address these questions about mass that I raised earlier. So first of all, what do we mean by an extra dimension? Well, I think most of us are familiar with three dimensions of space, up, down, forward, backward, left, right. 
Um, why would we even imagine that there could be another dimension? Well, if the history of physics has shown us anything, it's that there certainly can be more than meets the eye. That is to say, there can be more than what we, what we think is obvious. So it could be that there are extra dimensions, but they're hidden from us, or it could be there's just one extra dimension. Maybe it's too small to see, or its properties are very different. It's curved or warped in ways that we haven't anticipated. So it could be that there's stuff that's there. Just why not entertain that possibility? Another reason to think about it is, in fact, string theory. If string theory is right, there are other dimensions of space. But the final reason to think about it is that it, there's a possibility of showing connections that we would otherwise miss. Maybe this really is the answer to the question of why masses are what they are, or why gravity is so weak. Let me just give you a little bit of a flavor of why we think that could be true. And to understand that, we need to at least have one additional notion, and that will be it. It's called a brain world. The idea is that there can be an extra dimension of space, but not everything necessarily travels throughout those extra dimensions. You can have a lower dimensional surface, say a three-dimensional surface. Now, of course, I can't really draw that, so I've drawn it as two-dimensional in a three-dimensional world. But you could imagine that there's a three-dimensional brain in a higher dimensional world. And on that three-dimensional brain, maybe all the stuff we know about exists. So atoms, forces like um, electromagnetism could be just on the brain. My cousin Matt, who's holding the magnet there, um, they could all be living in this three-dimensional world. The reason we care about the extra dimension is that that's not true for gravity. Gravity knows about matter and energy anywhere in space, including the higher dimensional space. So you can imagine a theory where you have a three-dimensional world sitting inside a higher dimensional world where only gravity travels throughout the extra dimension. Now, why is that interesting from the point of view of particle physics? Well, Raman Sundram and I showed that if there is one extra dimension and we have two brains, which are called the weak brain and the gravity brain here, that are at the boundary of that extra dimension. So it's a very small extra dimension. It's 10 to the minus 30 centimeters, for example. Very tiny. Uh, there's two brains at the end. We live on one brain, and gravity is concentrated on the other brain. What we found by solving Einstein's equations, appropriate for the Einstein Institute, is that gravity varies exponentially in strength as we go from one brain to the other. So gravity could appear to be very strong on one brain and very weak on the other. Really how that manifests itself is that masses are very heavy on one brain, but exponentially smaller on the brain that we live on, just like we need them to be, that just exactly resolving this puzzle. Because you have this very small dimension, but anywhere away from it, masses could look extremely, small, extremely light. Now, why do we care about this? Well, there's actually, if it's true, we actually would be able to test this at the Large Hadron Collider. In particular, what you can have are protons collide, produce a particle called a Kaluza-Klein particle, a Kaluza-Klein boson, that travels in an extra dimension. And what's so interesting is that even though this particle is associated with gravity, which is the weakest known force, because of the warping of this dimension that we found, the fact that gravity varies exponentially as we go from one brain to another. It turns out that the kaluza klein particle interacts much more strongly than gravity. It has interactions related to those of gravity, but it's much stronger. And that means that that particle will decay inside the detector. And that is, in fact, how elementary particles have been found at these kind of colliders. They decay into particles we know about you then reconstruct what was there, what was the mass, what was the charge, what were the properties of that particle that decayed into it. And by doing that, you can figure out what that underlying theory is. And that means that if this idea is right, it might sound very exotic, it might sound too exotic to be true, but if it is right, it will have experimental consequences for the Large Hadron Collider. And in fact, it's one of the things they are looking for today. So that's all I'm gonna say about physics. I thought it would be fun to close since I've had some opportunity to do some other things, just to give a flavor of some of the cross-cultural connections of some of these ideas. So, I, so basically, these are the ideas that are going to be tested. There's a lot more, and I talk a lot about it. But I think it's also interesting to think about how science could feed into sort of more artistic endeavors and just sort of what are the conceptual ideas going on. And so I'll just illustrate that very briefly by telling you 
very briefly about a couple of projects I was fortunate to get involved in. One of them was an art show that I co-curated, and one was what we called a projective opera. So um, I'll just show you very briefly. The art show was actually called Measure for Measure, which is sort of a fun title. Um, and what we were trying to do is think, like, if we wanted to have an art science connection, then one thing you could do is try to have pretty pictures from science, or you can try to have art that mimics science. But what we thought would be more interesting would to have some theme that resonates both for artists and scientists. And you might not be surprised, given this lecture, that the theme that I chose was scale. To think about how artists would think, think of scale, which of course they're doing all the time, but also how scientists think of scale. Um, in particular, how by looking at different scales, you can see different laws in place. So most of the pieces that we had here were pieces where you saw this, where I don't, you viewed it on a large scale, you saw one thing. You viewed it on a small scale, you saw another. So this tree, for example, is a giant, giant sequoia tree, but if you look at a smaller scale, you see that it's composed of these very small, these small pictures of, of the bark, which of course has a very different sort of structure. And actually, I'm sorry, I, I didn't include one picture that I meant to include, which is this beautiful pop art looking piece, that if you look individually, you see pictures of, of sort of frozen video frames um, conveying emotion. So basically, every one of these pieces was such that it, you wanted to stand there and stare at it for a while, because you would see different things if you looked at different scales. And um, this is just one more. And the other thing I'm going to close with is just um, to give some indication of this opera that I mentioned. Because this was kind of a fun project. Um, after I wrote my first book, War Passages, um, a composer who worked at IRCOM, which is this electronic music institute associated with the Pompidou Center, um, contacted me because he wanted to write an opera about physics where he had sort of the opposite goal in the sense that he really wanted to have real physics in it. Um, I think what I wanted to do in it was sort of to use the extra dimension, sort of a metaphor for exploration or for discovery. So we ended up, um, and we cl collaborated also with the artist Matthew Ritchie, who did the sets. And so I'll just give you a, a small flavor of what we came up with, um, where we sort of had this extra dimensional world contrasted with the lower dimensional world. So I get to hear some of it and see some, so I'll show you a few slides. So he was in this lower dimensional, sort of darker, more black and white world. And she was in this more colorful world where she could explore another dimension, had more space available to her. Uh, we also had the problem of where to put the orchestra because it was in the Pompidou Center, so there was no pit. So they were behind this, a translucent screen. And Hector really wanted physics in it, so I allowed him to pick out an equation that we could put in that she got to sing. So it was really very funny. <laughs> and, um, and as you can see, she's exploring and confused by what she's seeing. And of course, they're also trying to convey to each other what they're seeing. And this is very important because I think it's really important to understand. Okay, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, it's very important to understand from just the nature of experiment because, you know, in some sense, we're not going to the extra dimension. She was able in this opera to go to the extra dimension. But we're more like him, where we're stuck back in this three dimensional world, and the clues are coming to us. And so it's up to us to interpret these signs of, of what's there. So what we're seeing are particles that have momentum from another dimension, potentially. We don't, we're not traveling there, but they have properties that indicate they come from another dimension. And in general, that's the state we're in in science, where we have these indirect clues and we have to piece them together. So as I've tried to indicate, there's sort of twofold themes in this book. Uh, one, which I didn't talk a lot about, I talked about scale, but basically scientific thinking in general, what goes into it creativity and discovery, the role of scale, uncertainty and risk, and truth and beauty, and what I called other scientific misconceptions, because I think it's really overrated, the role of truth and beauty, and how much it determines what we do. But as I talked about also what we're exploring today, um, in terms of what's going on at the LHC, how we're testing various models of what can exist. So I'd say that uh, we've come a long way, we understand a lot, but we have a lot to learn. So I'm just gonna close with one final slide, which is a picture that I saw at the Tate Museum, which I think conveys very nicely the idea that we're stuck in this sort of world where we don't necessarily see the full richness until we've given a window into it. What I didn't know at the time was the picture that's there is the Chateau de Sion, which is very close to CERN, which is where the Large Hadron Collider is located. So clearly not a coincidence. Okay, so thank you very much.
very nice overview of your book. Um, before we take questions from the audience, maybe I'll ask one question myself. Of course. Which is, um, so there is, you explored very much in detail the different scales in space and how the human plane scale sits inside the US microscopic and macroscopic scale. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the LHC is not only a very good microscope to understand the small scales, but in some sense it's also a very good time machine. So it also talks to, um, but I mean, I'll explain this in a second. <laughs> 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 it, it, it also explain, it also explores very well uh, oh. the very early universe. So this is maybe a, 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 a connection which is very, yeah. which is not very obvious. Yeah. So maybe you could say a few words about that. Yeah, so it does in some sense. So, in s okay, so earlier in the universe, of course, it's much hotter. And when it's hotter, particles exist that don't exist today, these heavier particles that we don't yet see. And forces and interactions can occur that we don't see today because they're appropriate to these higher energies and shorter distances. So in some sense, we are probing the forces and matter that could have been existing in the early universe. However, it is important to keep in mind that the early universe was different. It was much denser. So the way things happen in the early universe, it's, so it's not really reproducing the early universe, but it's reproducing some very idealized conditions where we can study what was there and how it interacted. And that, that is an important point, so thank you. Lisa, thank you for a terrific lecture. Um, there's really only one question probably that I'm qualified to ask, uh -oh. um, <laughs> but you uh, had as a teaser at the end, I'm really kind of bewildered. I can um, I can understand how one might overrate the the value of beauty. How is one overrating the value of I just, truth? No, that's that's fair. It's just that people tend to equate truth and beauty, and a lot of the time you hear these lectures where they say, you know, truth equals beauty and beauty equals truth, as the poet said. Okay, so but it is truth that you're it after. It is truth that we're after. Okay, yeah, so uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> Five years ago, I missed the question on transcendency and the so-called uh, metaphysics in religious or philosophical terms. And uh, when I heard your lecture about the, the warp passages, I was thinking of Mr. Bean being thrown into existence. Have we been thrown into existence from another world, a higher dimension? What about uh, God and... Uh, a physical way of um, mm. proof of existence of a, yeah. Okay, so creature. there's a lot of questions here, so let me try to uh, parse them a little bit. Okay. So first of all, and this is an important point with the scale theme, so let me just say this one first. In some ways, the way science advances is we systematically get to the next threshold of scale. Um, one of the big misunderstandings of the Big Bang Theory, for example, is that it describes everything except what banged. It describes what happens later. How things started is often a question we don't know. Even in evolution, we know what happens later on. So we don't know how things started. That's what we're looking for, but basically we systematically try to get there. But to a large extent, because it's always beyond what we can actually test, it's often guesses. I mean, maybe eventually we will figure out how life started, but that's not what evolution tells us. What evolution tells us is how it evolved once it already started. And in the same way, I don't pretend that we're giving the questions, uh, the answer to the question of how things started. We can speculate about that, but, we're, but that's speculation right now. In terms of um, the religion versus science questions, I actually do talk about that in this book a little bit. I have a little bit where I, where I try to identify what I think. I mean, a lot of the time it's you know, referred to as we're asking different questions, but I think there are, there's sort of fundamental difference that's important to keep in mind having to do with the sort of materialistic mechanistic view of science. But I think it's often overstated in the sense that, again, effective theory is a very important notion here. Um, I use the analogy of sort of music. I mean, we can understand music as coming about as oscillations of atoms in our ears or through our brains. But that doesn't tell us what music is. I mean, there's still some sort of effective theory explanation of what it is. And in the same way, although a scientist would say that ultimately our moral choices or whatever we do is premised on the ingredients in our bodies and our brains, it doesn't mean that it's telling us all of what's there. Nonetheless, we wouldn't say that there's some supernatural or God or other entity that comes because it does have to have some material effect. 
It doesn't mean it explains everything, but for a scientist, there would have to be some physical process that's going on. And so I think there are two important questions that I try to address. One is, what is the difference? And I think this is a core difference. But also the other question, I think, which is important, especially in America today, is why do we care so much? Why is this debate always appearing? And I think it has to do with sort of how we think we can control our environment better and understand the universe better. And I think people who believe in the scientific method believe that it will help us make progress. And so that's why I think it's so important. I have a question concerning um, the scales. And um, I was reading one of your books and... Um, There's only two books, by the way. I yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, yeah, but I just read one of them, yeah. And what really st uh, struck me, and that is really um, still on my mind, and that's why I wanted to have a comment from you on that, is it's, it's really striking that you have black holes um, in the very macroscopic scale, and you have all of a sudden black holes also on the very, very microscopic scale. And the thing I was wondering about is, um, could that help us um, to apply um, information theory? Because uh, we have a connection with the second law of thermodynamics and information theory on black hole physics on the macroscopic scale. Yeah. And all of a sudden, some level people do try to try to do that. Yeah. They try to understand sort of basic yeah. elements of information yeah. in terms of counting but, black holes. But, hole but do you see a bridge there, maybe for for unifying? Um, I don't think of it so much as a bridge. I think it's more that on the quantum scale, people try to count information sort of by counting black hole states. I think macroscopic black holes, I mean, eventually you might understand the dynamics, but those are sort of different kinds of questions that we're asking there. We want to ask questions like how does information get conserved if a black yeah. hole decays, which is yeah. certainly applying at, at big scales too. So there are a lot of information questions, and I think people have made progress in understanding both quantum mechanics and black holes by studying these, these kind of questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, sure, sorry. More questions? This one back there. Uh, I have a question. Uh, why do we concentrate on, on a very long uh, time scale uh, where we know that no humans will exist anymore? No, what will exist? Well, well we will be swallowed by the sun and there will be no human beings anymore. So, uh, I didn't say anything about those time no, scales. No, no, it's, it's an idea. Why do we want to know about those time frames? Yeah, I know. I always think it's funny, too. I mean, so we discover things like the accelerated expansion of the universe, and then someone will come ahead and say exactly how things will end in 10 to the 100th billion years or whatever. I mean, I think it's just a way of understanding what the implications are of this particular theory. I don't, I don't think we care in the sense that any of us are worried about our particular fates. Um, I think it's just following what the ev evolution of these equations tell us. It's a way of understanding what it means for the universe to accelerate. But I don't think it's the pressing scientific topic. More questions? Yeah, this one. Um, you showed us many uh, models and, and pictures about the other world, the brains and so on. Um, is there a way for you to, to discern between models who uh, are only an instrument to understand reality, whatever that is, and <coughs> pictures that show reality? Is it, do, do you, uh, can you reflect on the ontological value of, uh, of a model? Are they purely functional and give, just give us information about the structure of our mind? Or do they uh, do these models give also information about the structure of reality, or is there well to the extent that no these models no, between? I think I think this is the important point that I'm trying to make, and this is one of the things that I think gets misrepresented about science a lot. I mean, these models make predictions. These are predictions that you can go out and test. You can do an experiment and see does this particle exist? Do we measure this particle? So I think something that actually makes predictions for what you see and describes what you see is certainly describing reality. But what, what we see is, is already transmitted by a lot of models and instruments. But you see, that's, that's one of the points I'm making, that you can ask these questions, but the effective theory doesn't care. I mean, this is, you know, you can say, do, are Newton's laws really true? You can say, at the most fundamental level, they're not true. But they are true. Over a large range, they work. And it's perfectly fine to talk about distance and momentum and, and make predictions of where things will be when. Then you find out on an atomic scale, eventually it's going to break down. That doesn't mean that the model 
okay, that underlies me the most, it's wrong. It's an approximation. And, in that, and that, I think it's a much more practical, pragmatic way to think about it and to make advances in science, is to just acknowledge these are approximations, and that's fine. Uh, last question, would you uh, consent if we say we can think about dimensions and realities that we will never can prove, uh, uh, where we can never make a prediction? We, we I mean, we certainly do we work on that. Experiment on certain scales that are so small that we will never have an instrument or experiment to prove, but it is meaningful or is it meaningful for you to think about these realities? But then, then you enter somehow religious or metaphysics. Okay, so first of all, it, it's often premature to say never. I mean, for example, grand unified theories apply 13 orders of magnitude, and energy is 13 orders of magnitude higher than the energy of the Large Hadron Collider. So you might think you could never test it. But it turns out in this theory, in some versions of the theory, you predict the proton decays. And so they, by doing, and looking in large bats and looking for enough proton decays, they can put constraints, even though you might have thought this is a scale where you'll never be able to test it. So the first point is you'll never know the answer to whether you can test it unless you think about it. The second answer is that, this, for example, this idea about brains and extra dimensions of the large one, some of these notions came from string theory. We might never directly test string theory, but it led to some interesting progress. And the third is that, you know, I don't think it should be exclusively done, but I think making these theoretical connections often leads to just better understanding or deeper understanding. So it's, but of course, I wouldn't want all of science to be in that regime, but I think there is room for some of it to be like that. I have to say, this is kind of fun talking here because these questions are all different than the questions I usually get. <laughs> usually I get the same question. It's really fun. Um, they're somewhat more philosophical in, in origin, I guess. It's approximate it, yeah. So uh, what do you think, um, or what is the state of the um, actual graviton research? Are graviton research? Yes, there is um, graviton detectors. It's gravity wave detectors. Gravity wave detectors, yes. Yeah, oh. which are not graviton what detectors. It's okay. very different. Okay. <laughs> Gravitons are elementary particles that we don't have no idea how to detect. You might detect the fluids of Klein particles, but not the particles. Gravity wave detectors, actually, people very nearby work on, on these things. Um, and there's existing detectors. They're, they're um, big arms where they look for, and um, there's a suggestion for one up in space. Uh, America has basically canceled the project. Europe is continuing, so they might be able to look at even smaller distances. Um, you know, it's, there's so-called advanced LIGO. They might have a chance of seeing it, but they're not necessarily quite in the regime. But they're but basically because gravity is so weak, mm -hmm. you have they're looking for these big catastrophic events that occur, so maybe merging of black holes or something like that, which could give some signals that they hope to see. And um, there really are people here who work on this. You can probably talk to them if you're about it. We'll maybe have a lecture here if people are interested. I think Bernard Chupas is from this. Yeah. yeah. Do you believe yeah. that the gravitons exist? I believe that gravitons exist. Yes. And do gravitons? attract each other? Um, they're particles like any other, so they uh, obey the force of gravity. So okay. if they have energy and momentum, the same way other particles with energy and momentum are attracted by gravity. Could it's a very weak force. Could there be a collapse of graviton gas, a gravity collapse? If you had a well, in some sense, black holes might involve something like that. I mean, but, and that's a very force, there's such a strong force of gravity, everything collapses, and part of what's collapsing is just gravity. But you are far away from those models, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So. Um, yes, can, can I ask for how long is the LHC going on uh, to operate? How long is it? It probably uh, would be 20 years, at least. And it, there'll probably be upgrades along the way, or upgrade. For more than, for another 20 years, because I heard it's only uh, six months left, and if uh, they... Before it shuts down. Okay. And then it's, it's gonna shut down. Right now they're running at eight TV. The goal is 14 TV. You might not get quite up to that. So it's gonna shut down. Then they're going to make sure everything is in place. You might remember there was a bit of an explosion a few years yeah, ago. Yeah. So they wanna make sure everything is perfectly in place for when they go up to the higher energy. And in the process, also upgrade experiments, make sure everything is really working as well as it can. So it probably will be, it's gonna shut down in six months and then it will come back on about a year and a half later. 
two years later, we'll start getting uh, more real data. So there's going to be a gap where we don't get a whole lot of new data. And what are the results at the moment? What, what I've heard is that they um, found something, but still it has there's to There's hints prove of the Higgs boson. Yeah. This year, there will be about four times the amount of data, so we should know whether those hints are real or not. So the, there's a serious hope that at the end of this year, probably in December, we'll know whether or not the Higgs boson exists and whether it has the energy it seems to have, according to what they found. Um, there's also constraints being put on a lot of models because they haven't seen things like supersymmetry, which is another thing you can look for, or extrema. So there'll be lots of constraints that, that are put. Uh, but there's one thing that there's a serious hope that we would find could be the Higgs boson. Which I talk, we'll talk more about in the book if you want to know more about it. Um, and what comes next after the LHC? I mean, if there should be another particle accelerator, planning should like start soon or something? I know. So, I mean, ideally, personally, I would love to see a much higher energy machine because um, I don't know that the LHC has, a, I mean, the SSC that got canceled would have had about three times the energy, and that's really the energy we need to really explore this question. And we'll probably get hints at the LHC. It's not clear we'll answer all the questions. Another machine people talk about, we'll see if it's really true, is if it, this Higgs boson discovery turns out to be real, something that can really do precision measurements of the Higgs boson, because it would be a very different type of particle. So you'd want to know its properties in detail. But a lot will depend on non-scientific considerations, such as where we divide our resources and how we, what country wants to do it and things of that nature. 